that today's discussion is an important one. Um, we are here to recognize and honor the legacy and history of James Herring and Adolphus Ely, the founders of the Barnett Aiden Gallery, which was established in 1934 in Washington, D.C. It was the first successful black-owned gallery in the United States, and Adolphus Ely was charged with preserving the legacy of the Barnett Aiden collection after the death of Herring. Now, Adolphus was a friend and a protege. Michael is one of his protégés because he was also an art dealer and art consultant. And so in exploring his life, I would like to introduce everyone to Michael Evanson, who is going to be co-presenting with me this afternoon and help us dig deeper and explore further the life of Adolphus Ely. Uh, Michael is working full-time as a federal grants administrator and has spent the last 20 years working with the Ryan White uh, HIV AIDS program, a clinical care and treatment program for people who are uninsured living with HIV, the HIV disease. At heart, Michael is an artist who spent many years studying classical music. When first enrolled at the University of Maryland, he was an instrumental music major having taken music lessons at the Peabody Conservatory and toured Mexico with an all-American youth orchestra. So you're a really fascinating person. <laughs> so I'm just going to um, read just a brief synopsis from my curatorial statement to put the gallery into context, Aiden and Herring, and also Adolphus Ely. So again, back to the 1934 opening of the gallery. Um, it was the first successful owned, successfully owned gallery in the United States that was owned, black owned, I should say. There was another that predated that. It was established by Augusta Savage in New York, but it did not sustain itself. Um, during the 1930s, you have to keep in mind that our nation was racially divided. Segregation by law was the order of the day. And due to the efforts of Aiden and Herring, African American art was unfolding in Washington. And I'm going to walk you through, through sort of a chronology of how that unfolded. They set precedence by creating the first integrated gallery, uh, featured with the works of artists of different ethnicities. And I drew from uh, Dr. Gail Abbott's dissertation on the Barnett Aiden Gallery, and I thank uh, Michael for bringing that to my attention. As significant as their efforts were, there has not been a lot of scholarship around what occurred um, historically, and we hope that this conversation will help to remedy that in some way, that it's somewhere far or near that someone will put the Barnett Aiden Gallery on its radar and begin to dig deeper. Uh, Dr. Abbott did state that part of what her challenge was is that there, were, there was an absence or a lack of uh, documentation to help her further her understanding and research. So um, in creating a gallery, um, as they did, Dr. Abbott wrote in her dissertation on the Barnett Aiden Gallery, that they chose to emphasize the artist's artistic similarities rather than their racial differences. And then there's a quote by Ely, who was the second curator for the gallery. It, as in the gallery and the collection, was a validation of black creativity. As a result of their efforts, African American art is now recognized within the canon and context of America's art history. And for me personally, as a gallerist and art consultant, the Barnett Aiden Gallery has served as a model for me in many ways. Well, one, the gallery is in my home. My husband and I are, I wish I could say we own this building, but we're buying the building. <laughs> so um, as with the Barnett Aiden Gallery, it was established in their home as well. Now, we have almost 5,000 square feet. So the gallery is, uh, the first floor is our dedicated gallery space, and then we live on the upper floors. But that was and is a model for what it is that we are, uh, the way in which we operate here, and certainly it was a model for uh, which the Barnett Aiden Gallery operated. 
Uh, and there are other similarities. My gallery is also integrated. Uh, while the collection has its legacy in being one that was and primarily focused on African American art, it only became so after a Ely took it over. So we'll talk about that dynamic shift. But they were absolutely dedicated to having their uh, gallery represent uh, multicultural artists, and the collection was built upon that premise. Um, and so over the years, I'm sorry, the, the gallery uh, showed the work of Matisse and Kandinsky, Picasso, and other German expressionists. And, and lastly, I just, before I get into the uh, PowerPoint presentation, I wanted to share with you um, a quote that Herring made. Now, he established Howard's uh, gallery, and that predated um, the Barnett Aden. And, uh, and with that practice, the, the artists were shared. They may have been shown at Howard and also in the Barnett Aden uh, Gallery. And in an essay that he wrote for an exhibition catalog, he stated, and this was for Howard, at Howard Exhibition, he stated that our policy has been to leave discovery of racial and national artists to our chauvinist friends. We have preferred to exhibit the works of all schools and trends, regardless of ideology or any designated sphere. And I too adhere to that and hope that if this is your first time that you will come to know that and if you have continued to come to our gallery, you will have seen evidence of that in the exhibitions that we hold. So let's begin. All right. Michael and I are going to share in this discussion. <laughs> so first, I wanted to sort of give you a little bit of background information on Harry. Um, he was from Silo, South Carolina. His father was Jewish. And you'll come to understand as we dig deeper into his background why skin color played uh, an important role in what he was able to achieve during a segregated South. Uh, during a period of segregation. He graduated from Syracuse University uh, with a degree in fine art um, and, and achieved his bachelor's in pedagogy and art degree. Um, he established the art department at Howard University and in 1930 30 organized the art gallery at Howard University, which was established in the basement of the uh, church there. I think it's Rankin, 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 Chapel. Rankin Chapel. From 1931 to 52, he served as the chairman of the art department and um, the first art gallery. So it is historically uh, Howard's, the, the gallery established at Howard is the first that was established at a historically black university and the only gallery to be directed and controlled by African Americans. And he was an accomplished artist. And this is uh, a painting of his that is in the uh, Johnson collection, that being uh, Robert Johnson, uh, the owner of BET. And now for Alonzo James Aiton. And we have family members, descendants, relatives of his here <coughs> joining us today. Will you raise your hand, please? <laughs> later for uh, Q&A and, and have people um, you know, contribute to the conversation, so we'd love to have you uh, contribute then. Uh, so Alonzo was uh, born on May 6th, my, grand, my grandson's birthday, uh, in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Um, information about his parents. In 1933, he graduated from Howard with a Bachelor of Arts in Education. 1930, he served as a curator for the gallery at Howard, and he was also the first curator for the Barnett Aiden Gallery. Now, one, one thing that really fascinated me about both of these gentlemen is, given the climate in our country, how well-educated they were and how well-traveled they were. I mean, uh, Aiden um, secured a Rockefeller scholarship. Um, Alonzo, I can't remember, but I do have it written down. I'll go through my notes. He also uh, traveled to London and Canada on a scholarship. So, and, and taught 
at a, a multitude of universities before landing at um, Howard University. So um, here we have, uh, and I don't know the date of this visit, but Eleanor Roosevelt was a frequent visitor to the gallery. And her presence and that of other dignitaries um, was a way of validating what was being done there, validating uh, who these gentlemen were and what they were achieving, and also about uh, it, just the climate and what was happening in Washington. So for her to have been there truly meant a lot. Now the gallery was located in a black uh, community, solely black, so white people had to choose to go into a black neighborhood, and many of them did. So I wanted to uh, share just a few facts about, again, about the history of the gallery. Again, it was established in 1931 in their home. Uh, the address is 127 Randolph Street, so if you're ever in DC, do a drive-by. Um, the home before they acquired it was actually owned by Alma Thomas, and they purchased it from her. And Herring actually helped her to acquire the home, and then ultimately ended up buying it thereafter. Uh, again, it was the first successful black-owned gallery in the United States. It was integrated, again, showing uh, artists of different nationalities, race, and ethnicities. And the curatorial approach, uh, meaning the way in which they exhibited the work, was to exhibit that of unknown artists or emerging artists along with other prominent and well-established artists. So, and for example, an artist like um, Alma Thomas, who was very young during that time, would have had her work shown with Tanner uh, or, or, or Bannister. So that, uh, you know, was very important for the artists in having their work validated and in their, on their path of becoming a professional artist. And this painting uh, by Augustus Dunbeer, which is featured in the back gallery space, was a, a, a painting which was an original part of the Barnett Aiden collection and is featured in this book on uh, the Barnett Aiden collection. And so it has a really fascinating history. It was gifted to Jacqueline Miller. Jacqueline, you raise your hand. Um, who is the uh, sister of Michael. And uh, so again, we're going to talk about that relationship and how important it was to the two of them. And uh, we have, we're fortunate to have a clip of Adolphus speaking specifically about this piece. And keep in mind about how the collection was built, which was around a multicultural group of artists. So Dunbeer was not an African American artist. And the title of this piece is Negro Woman. Now this painting is by Augustus Dunbar. It's a study of Negro woman, it's called. This is a beautiful painting simply because this was done in the 30s. And you find a black woman here who really exists as a beautiful, soft subject. She's not proving anything to anybody, blacks, whites, or what have you. And this is a state that's very hard to find people in today. Mm -hmm. She's just in her own state. Today, everything is contrived. You're proving what you're about, what you can mm -hmm. do and what you mm -hmm. can't. But here she was in her own world. She was not concerned about proving herself as black as beautiful, that is beautiful. She knew that. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you know, it's hard to find an expression like this now. She's just in her own world, maybe a meditative state. And we have to preserve this type of sight in our people. Most definitely, because like you said, meditative, she looks as if she's thinking of she's something. She's within herself, mm -hmm. exactly. She's not working on without, she's within. Mm -hmm. Now that footage, which I found online, um, is an interview between uh, Adolphus Ely and Deborah Ray. Uh, the program was De Detroit Black Journal and it was uh, conducted in 1980. So it's about uh, 26 minutes, almost a half hour interview and I encourage you to go online and listen to the, the full extent of it. It's, it's quite a fascinating interview. And if, if you notice, it said at McDonald's Corporation, Adolphus was actually able to secure funding from McDonald's to create educational material for black children. Uh, and that's why that sponsorship note 
appears in the video clip there. So let's talk about uh, a little bit about how the uh, collection was built. Um, the gallery operated for 25 years and held approximately 200 exhibitions. And this information was, again, taken from Dr. Abbott's dissertation. Uh, they showcased the work of over approximately 400 artists, with only 25% of the works were by black artists. Uh, Herring had an agreement with the artists that allowed him to choose and retain one work from each show. Um, that's, that was really key to their ability to build this collection. All gallery sales went in full to the artists. So, of course, the artists were, especially those who were emerging, were eager to give over a piece, um, given, again, that no other galleries, there were very few galleries in Washington during the 30s, 1930s, and they were the only one that would allow the work of African-American artists to be shown, but even white emerging artists were having a difficult time having, uh, securing gallery representation. So to give over a piece and know that if it's sold, you will get 100% of the proceeds, of course, was very attractive to artists. And um, so with that arrangement, they were able to attract you know, a lot of artists. And then later, where they may have found duplicates or maybe uh, there was another artist whose work there was a void in the collection, uh, Herring or Aiden would trade or sell that piece to acquire yet another one. So the culture of the gallery, which was very critical, uh, it was a cultural hub. That's where the elitist and non-elitist went. That was a gathering place. That's where uh, intellectual discourse uh, unfolded. And, and again, this was a multiracial, multicultural place where people came. So you had artists, writers, musicians, and politicians of all race. They met there uh, freely for social and professional engagement. Um, some of the distinguished guests were Duncan and Marjorie Phillips, which now we have the Phillips Collection. Uh, the directors of the Corcoran and the National Collection of Fine Art, as well as congressmen. So it really was a place that you wanted to be and be seen. And it's my understanding, and there's, this information differs depending on source, and I looked at several. Um, the invitation, the ability to be there was by invitation. And um, black women wore long gowns and lace white gloves and attended the Sunday afternoon openings. I'm a little underdressed today. <laughs> a little shabby. <laughs> they would probably just be appealed at our plastic cups and paper plates <laughs> back there. <laughs> This is how we roll in the 21st century. <laughs> so I want to go back to the relationship, or just rather touch upon the relationship with Phillips and uh, Herring. Uh, what I learned through my research is that, again, back the topic of, of skin color. So with uh, Herring having had a, a Jewish father and Aiden being very light-skinned, they were able to navigate in a way that a brown skin, even a person of my skin color, or a dark-skinned person, would not have been able to. It was just the honest truth. And so Duncan, Duncan Phillips and Herring would travel to New York, and it was, and I read where uh, Herring may have been instrumental in Duncan's uh, acquiring this Jacob Lawrence series. So he was instrumental in that. And as you may know, uh, the Phillips Collection owns, I think, half of that body of work. So it's, it's really interesting. Uh, he made, Herring made several trips. I didn't read where Aiden made trips to New York. And uh, again, because the scholarship is not full and extensive, it's quite possible that he traveled as well. But it was specifically stated in many different sources um, that Herring and Phillips made frequent trips to New York. And he, Herring, encouraged Phillips to acquire the work of black artists. Ortiz, if I could add also, yes, um, one of the most interesting aspects of the dissertation uh, by Dr. Abbott was 
quite a bit of, of dialogue about the cultural dynamics that were going on in Washington. And it really did, I mean, for me, it was a very fascinating read because, uh, as Mertiz mentioned, it went into the skin color issues, but also the cultural dynamics, which, as Mertiz also mentioned, um, both Herring and, and Aiden were able to navigate realms of cultural of culture that many of us wouldn't have been able to. But it was just, I, I thought that was one of the most fascinating parts of the dissertation because I've never read anything about, I mean, I've heard bits and pieces about Washington having uh, sort of the Gold Coast of light-skinned people and the sort of cultural dynamic that that brought to the area. But this dissertation goes into it more artistically and more culturally than I've ever heard it. And so it was really fascinating and I was really happy to be able to give that to Mertiz as a resource. Yes, and I thank you for that. It was very enlightening, a very enlightening read for me. Uh, Dr. Abbott was not the only one that touched upon that, and because I read it over and over again at different sources, I thought that it was relevant enough to uh, bring to the table this afternoon, because it, without the ability to navigate in the way that they did, what would have become of the gallery the collection, or, or the just everything that surrounds it. It wouldn't have come together. Yes. At that level yeah, of quality. I'm, I'm convinced of it. Given how segregated the country was at that point, uh, they probably would not have been able to achieve what they were able to achieve had it been had their skin color been different. So now we're going to talk about. Dr. Ely, and I want to uh, read a little bit of what Michael provided in terms of his relationship with uh, Dr. Ely. So, Michael was fortunate to ride around as co-pilot on many of Ely's artistic journeys in Washington, D.C. as Adolphus was museum curator, art appraiser, art collector, and creative consultant to many clients, artists, and business associates in the Washington area. Michael appreciates that Adolphus was an extraordinary artist himself and always worked to ensure a lasting legacy for the Barnett Aiden collection. So now we're going to delve more deeply into who Dr. Ely was and then open the discussion to Michael uh, about his relationship with Adolphus. So Adolphus was born in 1941 in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, he Dates, I could not find dates on when he um, secured or earned his uh, Master's of Fine Art degree, nor the year of his doctorate. Only was able to uh, locate information about the fact that he had achieved both of these. Um, and then again, he served as a second curator for the Barnett Aiden Gallery from 1961 until 1969. Now, in preserving the legacy of the collection, upon Herring's death in 1969, the collection was bequeathed to three of his friends. A Cecil Marquez, uh, he was a friend and gallery supporter in New York, was gifted the sculptures. Uh, Dr. Felton Earls, friend and board member in St. Louis, received books, graphic arts, and prints. And then uh, Adolphus, who was a friend and curator in Washington, inherited the majority of the collection, including its ceramics, oil paintings, watercolor paintings, and mixed media works. So a lot of people are under the impression that Adolphus sold the collection to Bob Johnson, or somehow it was lingering out there, and it went from Adolphus to Johnson. It did not. Um, the Florida Endowment Fund for Higher Education acquired it in, um, what year? In the 19, I believe that they acquired it in 1989. Um, so during the time that Ely opened up, he moved to Boca Raton, Florida. He opened up a gallery there, the History Through Art Gallery. Um, and at that time, the collection, there were about 250 pieces by 19th and 20th century African American artists and artists of other ethnicities. Now that's what he inherited. 
But upon taking on the collection, um, Ely shifted his focus and started acquiring the work solely of African American artists. So it, after that, it became a predominantly a collection of predominantly African American art. Um, Dr. Israel Tribble was a patron of Ely's gallery, and Ely had tried for years to try to find a home for the collection and was unsuccessful until meeting uh, Dr. Tribble, who was the CEO of the Florida Endowment Fund. And Ratisse, I remember hearing him often say that he was very, very interested in securing a home because he didn't like the idea of it being limited to just a small group of people to be able to appreciate it. So that was something that, while I had fallen out of touch with him um, during this particular time frame in the late 80s and 90s, um, I was very pleased to hear that he had found a home. He had found a place where it could be actually secured. Wonderful. And so the endowment fund, which was also associated with the Tampa Museum of African American Art, the collection was housed there and exhibited there. But the museum closed in the 1990s and went defunct. And it, it was at that point that Mr. Johnson acquired the collection. In 1998, it was purchased by BET, Robert Johnson, for an estimated $400,000. Now, I can't, yeah, I know, what? <laughs> I can't validate that. I cannot substantiate that. Um, there was another source that and they did not name who this person was. They just say a, a, uh, a gallerist <coughs> said that he acquired it for an estimated $400,000. So I can't quantify that, qualify that. Um, but that it, as soon as he acquired it, it quadrupled in value. Now, it was, it's also suggested that the reason he was able to get it at that price was because the works needed uh, conservation, they had not been conserved properly, they had not been stored properly, so several of the paintings needed a lot of work. And I, again, I cannot substantiate that. Um, in 2015, Johnson began to donate many of the works to the Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture, and I was able to find uh, verification of that a press release on the museum's website. He has not donated everything, but he has donated some substantial works. Uh, Tanner, uh, Flight into um, Egypt, and uh, Alma Thomas, so some of the most preeminent artists of that era and out of that collection, uh, the work has found its way into the uh, museum's permanent collection. Um, but I wanted to just mention a couple other things because I skipped over some of my notes. I did want to go back to um, the gallery and artists who sort of matriculated through it uh, because I thought that it was really fascinating that, again, Alma Thomas, Lois Malou Jones, Romare Bearden, uh, who was in New York but was shown uh, he and Jake Lawrence were New York artists, but many of the Harlem Renaissance artists were exhibited in the um, Barnett Eden Gallery. And um, I wanted to share a few facts because I found this fascinating. Uh, Alma Thomas was the first graduate of Howard's uh, art department, established by Herring in 1924, and that, was, that made her also the first woman in America to earn a bachelor's degree in art. So again, what these gentlemen were accomplishing and what they were able to achieve in Washington was just incredible to me and really phenomenal in their efforts and in the legacy that has been born out of that. Uh, Dr. David Driscoll um, had his first solo exhibition at the Barnett Aiden Gallery. He was, um, and I think I have it here somewhere, he was the, he worked as an assistant um, from 1952 to 1955 and served as a director from 61 to 63 and participated in many exhibitions during that time. So, Michael. <laughs> yeah, look at that. That yeah. was over 40 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> 
So this is Michael on the left, Jacqueline, who's here with us today also, and Adolphus. So now I turn the floor over to you. Tell us about that photo, what was happening there, and your relationship with Adolphus. Okay, first of all, I just want to thank Alex and Ortiz for having me here today to talk with you all. It's really uh, uh, terrific. I can't, I can't say how excited it was to be invited in, so uh, thank you. But yeah, this was a photo taken Jacqueline at uh, an anniversary party for our parents. An anniversary party for our parents. And um, I, I think of my dad's retirement, but my sister Jacqueline always corrects me. <laughs> it was an anniversary party for my parents. And so we had a 60, 60 years. years they've been together. It was at the Tidewater Inn in Yeah, East the Tidewater Inn in Easton, Maryland. Maryland. Mm -hmm. My parents have been together 60 years. We had a tap dancer for my dad who performed. <laughs> and he thought that was the best thing he had ever seen. <laughs> and so Adolphus was there along with his mother. Adolphus's mother yeah. was also there with us that day. But just a little bit about my relationship with Adolphus for you all. Um, I had met Adolphus when I was living in Philadelphia, uh, this was around 1976, and I met him through a dear friend of mine named Dwight Moore, and Dwight was an artist. And I remember one day, I, was, I, was a, I worked for the family court, I was a project officer for juvenile delinquents in Philly, <laughs> and um, I was actually on my way back to the D.C. area to go back to school and finish up my bachelor's degree, but I, uh, my friend Dwight said, I have this artist you need to meet, this guy named Adolphus Ely. Uh, he's been in, uh, he's the director of the Philadelphia Museum, African American Museum. And, uh, you know, just come on, go by with me and meet him. So I said, okay, after work, we stopped by, the, you know, the museum. And so Adolphus met me, uh, Dwight, he'd already met Dwight, of course, and Adolphus walked us around the museum. He showed us, uh, it was a brand new museum built from the ground up. Um, there was obviously a lot of art there, and he sort of took time and, and gave us a tour. And then we went out to dinner, Dwight and Adolphus and I. And, and from there, we just cultivated a friendship. Um, I didn't really know much about Adolphus. It was sort of like meeting somebody the first time, and you just get to know them over time. And so that's, we just embarked upon a friendship. But it was, he had an uncanny way of just putting people at ease. And it was like we had just known him. I mean, my sister, she's nodding her head. It was, we just felt like he was somebody we had known. It was just, he just had that way about him. And so, um, at the time, as I mentioned, he was living here in Washington, but he would come to Philadelphia Monday through Friday. So he, it was like his weekly gig that he would come to Philadelphia and work, and then he would come back to Washington and, uh, you know, that's where he lived. He lived at uh, LaJoy Park, that was a third and T, um, where, the, where most of the artwork was, was kept for the Barnaby collection. So, so again, this was sort of the launch, on, the launch pad for my friendship with Adolphus. And um, uh, as I mentioned, my plan was to go back to school. I went back to school uh, maybe about eight to 10 months after I met Adolphus, and by that time, we were talking, you know, fairly often, and uh, as it turned out, as chance would have it, my apartment was located about 10 blocks from his mother's home. So, uh, eventually, when he would come home on the weekends, um, I was able to go by with him to meet his mom and his siblings. He had three siblings who lived there as well uh, with his mom, but this was where he would come in on the weekends and. Then we would get together on a Saturday morning and I would sort of ride co-pilot with him around as he would deliver art, he would um, talk to um, folks who were interested in purchasing art, he would advise them. Uh, he had a real sixth sense for being able to tune into people and anticipate what their artistic interests would be. Uh, and, he, and that also translated over into his business sense. I mean, he. He always, as I mentioned, had a desire to find a home for the collection um, that was outside of his home, you know, something with a broader uh, scope to allow people to appreciate it. But um, these Saturday excursions, as I'll call them, were opportunities for me, uh, sort of as a young person learning to appreciate art, um, it was a great venue. Um, I got to ride with him, for example, to Alma Thomas's home. She lived on 15th Street Northwest. 
Um, I, one Saturday morning, went by her home with him when he stopped by to talk with her. And I mean, he'd be talking to her, and I was just sort of oogling her art, her studio. I mean, it was full of all kinds of paint and her signature abstracts with the concentric circles that she's become quite renowned for. Her home was full of it. Her, her whole, it was like, it was sort of a, a setup like this where the entire first floor was her studio and then down the steps came her sister, Maurice Thomas, and uh, I told Mertice that uh, Alma's sister, Maurice, was uh, so happy. She was just so jovial and she had just returned from a trip to Greece. I mean, I remember this like it was just yesterday. But again, these Saturday excursions were where I would be riding along sort of soaking up some of the artistic talent and creativity that Adolphus was involved in. And at the time, I had no idea who Alma Thomas was. I mean, I, you know, he also had other um, business contacts like Max Robinson, who was uh, the news anchor in the DC area. He, he had become quite renowned. Uh, he was also an artistic client of Adolphus's. And, uh, and I would hear Adolphus, of course, talk about folks and say, well, you know, I've talked to Max today and he, he's interested in getting um, you know, and Alma Thomas, and I, you know, so on and so forth. So, I mean, again, I was just listening. For me, I was more on the friendship side of it. Um, I was just learning about art, and I was really uh, uh, learning to appreciate his uh, experience and, uh, and his creativity. As, as most of you know, he was also an artist himself. Yeah, let's look at the work here uh, of this piece um, to my left is a painting by Adolphus, which is um, from your collection. It was gifted to you by Adolphus, my understanding. And to the right of that is his student, protege, Dwight Moore. And for me, I can see a direct correlation yes. in terms of style and inspiration and influence. There is. And uh, as I mentioned, Dwight was the, the young man who introduced me to Adolphus. And, Dwight was a very talented pen and ink artist, as well as he worked in acrylic. Uh, I have some friends who have some of Dwight's work, and Dwight's work was phenomenal. I mean, he was quite a talented artist. And I think that that's what captured Adolf's, uh, Adolphus's interest and attention, because he knew that Dwight was talented, and Dwight was always interested in learning watercolor. So I, I was able to uh, one day observe Adolphus providing an art lesson to Dwight. And so what you see here is uh, the end result of a lesson that Dwight had with Adolphus. And uh, Adolphus explained to Dwight that watercolor is one of the most complex mediums because, of course, you can't control water. I mean, water is very, <laughs> I mean, it's very thin, it's very fluid. And, and I remember hearing Adolphus tell Dwight, Dwight, no, listen, this is what you need to do to make this work. And so, uh, as you can see, Dwight, uh, uh, on his own was able to, uh, I think, capture uh, some very nice uh, art uh, as a result of having Adolphus as a, as a teacher. Absolutely. And I don't think I mentioned that uh, many of Adolphus's paintings were part of the original Barnett Aiden collection as well, and they're featured in this uh, book also. So here we have uh, Adolphus as art dealer and mentor. In the picture on the photograph on the left, we have Adolphus and Dr. Richard Dotson, and then on the right is Thurlow Evans Tibbs, which well, a lot of people don't know that he was a mentee of Adolphus. Yes, and there were many times, uh, actually the picture on the left with uh, Dr. Dotson, uh, Dr. Dotson and I were college um, colleagues, and he and I both went to the University of Maryland, and this was another of the Saturday excursions where uh, Dr. Dotson had purchased Smart and was interested in consulting. And so Adolphus said, Michael, why don't you ride over with me? So I did. And we rode over to Dr. Dotson's home. And this was one of the times when um, there was a lot of conversation about artwork, what to purchase, what was most lucrative, what was of particular interest, that kind of uh, conversation. And, uh, and then I remember Thurlow, uh, many times I went by his, he had a gallery, he had a small gallery himself, and had some very beautiful uh, artwork. Uh, and I remember going by his place as well, and uh, seeing him, meeting him, uh, having the opportunity to listen in on conversations and consultations that Adolphus had with him as well. Yes, and the 
Evans Tibbs collection was, well, uh, uh, Thurlow bequeathed that to the Corcoran. And um, when the um, Corcoran closed, the collection went to the National Gallery in DC. The quote, average person, which I consider all of us average, we need to approach art from within. Uh, it's not about definitions. I think art is very personal. What you see in it doesn't necessarily have to be what someone else sees in it. I think the important thing about Afro-American art is that most black people can identify something about themselves within it or their history. Uh, this is one reason why it's important to emphasize black art to the world and the black community because quite often if you go into a regular museum, there are very few paintings representative of black culture. Therefore, that museum will not have the same meaning to that person as it would another person whose culture it represents. Now, if we go to a museum and we find things that represent our culture, our beliefs, our hopes, we tend to identify personally with it. This is why it's very important that you have Afro-American art in museums, city museums. You take a group of black children into a museum, and they're looking at another culture. They can't see things, uh, recognize paintings and say, it looks like my grandmother, or this, I remember seeing this in my neighborhood. It has no relation to them. And yet, you will call that child uncultured because you didn't get anything from that museum visit. The point is, it wasn't relative to him. Even though you're not telling him to ignore what was there, he has to appreciate other cultures. But his culture should be identified there too because he is a black American and he is an American. Is that experience? Yes. yes. <laughs> so uh, part of how I discovered Matisse was because um, when I was at the University of Maryland and Adolphus recommended that I take an African American art survey course that Dr. David Driscoll was teaching. So uh, when I took that course from Dr. Driscoll, um, which I thoroughly enjoyed, it sort of ties to the theme that Adolphus just mentioned about how important it was for us as people of color to learn how to appreciate art and to see ourselves reflected in the art that is African American, culturally speaking. And so, uh, I thought back to that moment and I thought, well, who can I talk to about art? And so I reached out to the David Driscoll Center and they uh, recommended someone who referred Mertice to me. And so that's what brought me sort of to her. Uh, so I just, again, really appreciate that. Yeah, we had, what, a two hour <laughs> discussion when he mentioned Adolphus because I have known of him, I've known of the Barnett Aiden Gallery for a number of years. Again, it, they have set the standards of excellence in many ways in which I try to emulate through my practice as a gallerist and an, and an arts professional curator and art dealer. And uh, so to, uh, to have a brother who I could share in the conversation with, I mean, we just had a hoot of a time. I thought, this man is going to think I am crazy <laughs> by the time I get off this phone. But we just connected immediately, and it was a great conversation. And an important one to have, which led to his being here today. And this program, um, we're, we're only able to just kind of touch the surface of, of, of the subject of the Barnett Aiden Gallery, the collection, and the two gentlemen who established it, the founders, and Adolphus. Um, I'm going to extend this conversation. Uh, biannually, we have an exhibition called Art of the Collectors, which uh, features the works of, um, out of private collections. I sell and handle estates and that's what brought us together, private collections and estates and institutions who wish to sell works out of their collections. And so I usually pull all those client works together and feature them in, in that show. And because, and the irony of this, on many occasions in the past, artists who were represented through that gallery have been a part of that exhibition. I thought that I will have another program, perhaps a tea, There's a, we have Tea with Mertie series, and really dig far more deeply into this subject because there are so many people of all walks of life who are collectors, arts professionals, it's almost like Henrietta Lacks, they don't know the story. 
And uh, because the impact and what they achieved and accomplished, whatever good and bad way it might be uh, interpreted, was so significant and important historically that I think the conversation should continue. So at this point, I'm going to, Michael, did you have anything else you'd like to share with us? No, I think that's All complete. Right. So I have a few more questions for you in case the crowd gets quiet. <laughs> uh, but I'd like to open up the conversation now to everyone and ask if you have any questions you'd like to ask. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Patricia Wilson Aiden. I am the president and CEO of the African American Museum in Philadelphia, and I am a member of the Aiden family. The Aiden family is on a journey right now. Uh, as you said, there's very little scholarship regarding the role of Alonzo Aiden, but in many ways, he was the first trained black curator. And yes. so he, <laughs> he was. <laughs> he was. And so we are on a journey to uncover further scholarship um, about Aiden, about his role, uh, about uh, his particular contribution, not only to the Barnett Aiden collection, but to African American art in general. We have had discussions with David Driscoll and others, and we are eager for you to continue this conversation. So I want to first applaud you and thank you for uh, allowing us to participate in this conversation. But I would also like to say that in the world of art, provenance, 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 you know, uh, there, is, there are huge questions regarding the provenance of the Barton Aiden collection. And while you use the word uh, inherited, Adolphus Ely inherited the collection, that's questionable. And I do have to put that out there that there have been questions. He might have been the last man standing, but that does not mean that he legally inherited the works. So the, that's part of the exploration that we as a family are undertaking. We're very pleased that the majority of, not the majority, but a good part of the most significant pieces of work are now in the hands of respective repositories, whether it is the National Museum of African American History and Culture, whether it is uh, the University of Richmond, uh, the collection which was once endangered is now in better hands, and we're very pleased about that. Uh, I also want to clarify a little bit about Adolphus Ely and the African American Museum in Philadelphia, then known as the African uh, Afro-American Museum of History, uh, History and Culture. Uh, we consider him the second executive director and curator. Dr. Charles Wesley was uh, principally responsible for the museum's, uh, for the museum while it was being constructed and as it first opened. Ely came along after it first opened. So Dr. Charles Wesley, uh, should always be acknowledged for his very key role. Um, I have with me here my brother-in-law, Leonardo Barnett Aiden. Uh, Lenny, do you want to say anything? Oh, uh, I only wanted to uh, let Alex? the art group know that Alonzo Aiden went to Germany, you know, in 1936, the Owens was breaking world records in, uh, in, in track and field. So all of this took place before Mr. Ely, or Dr. Ely, uh, became a student of uh, 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 Professor Herring, only because, as I said to you, if you notice, Adolf Zeely was born in 41. Both of these gentlemen, my uncle was born in Spartanburg, South Carolina. So uh, Professor Herring and he had a lot of uh, similarities as far as that. They both happened to be light. And for me to think of a, a man of but you can't say a man of color, because he was extremely light. 
but uh, to go to Germany in 1936 and study and studied abroad, as you mentioned, in London and other places. It's a uh, it's it's quite a quite a feat that we have to acknowledge. And it wasn't mentioned, but Picasso had works in the Barnett Aiden collection. See. Black artists could not get their work shown. And what made it significant is Eleanor Roosevelt was a patron of that gallery. And as you saw her picture, and you couldn't mention the year, but I was a, a very young man at uh, probably about five years old <laughs> when, when, when that took place. So that was around 1953, 1953, when that was. Uh, that picture was shown. I happened to be there that day. But I am not trying to uh, claim anything only because sports was what my love and passion was. And as a result, uh, not to jump on a bandwagon, but not to let history get distorted. That's, that's all I want to say. No, I thank you for that. Um, and again, you know, I say everything with a great deal of caution because I relied on research that was out in the cyberspace ethers and, you know, some that I found conflicting dates. Uh, the number of works in the collection differed depending on the source. And, um, however, I did read through several sources that Ely inherited the collection, so I only present what I discovered. Um, but I want to go back to Aiden's travels uh, because I think, again, that, that was really important to mention and to state specifically that he won a Rockefeller Foundation scholarship and took a leave of absence from his job at Howard University to study museum curation and administration in 1935. He graduated from the Buffalo Museum of Science in February 1936 with a certificate in visual education. He spent the year traveling to London, Cologne, Berlin, uh, Dresden, Munich, Venice, Florence, Rome, and Brussels. He returned to Howard in 1934 and in 1940 was named curator of the Tanner Hall Arts Gallery at the American Negro Exhibition in Chicago. So the accolades just go on and on and on. And um, going back to physical description, I read in one, and it may have been Dr. Abbott's uh, dissertation, where she said that he had, at some point, until he got a little older, he had blonde hair and blue or green eyes. Chris, Christine, blue eyes. I don't know if you can. <laughs> my, my father was the one with the light hair. OK. <laughs> But again, I just found it fascinating that, that uh, through several sources, there was always made mention their physical descriptions, herrings as well, and how dapper they were, how they dressed, their whole appearance. Uh, Aiden was uh, stated that he wore like white suit uh, jacket and pants, and uh, Herring was known for his diamond cufflinks and cane. So, and, and which I guess speaks to why uh, women showed up in, in black gowns and uh, white gloves. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, 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 I was I was just uh, curious. Did they uh, when they travel abroad and as they move in these circles? Did they were they passing or were they acknowledging? You know, we're with. I'm not certain. I think in many ways it was implied, but I'm not certain about that. You're shaking your head no. I, I, I wasn't even twinkling in my parents' eye at that time. I wasn't born until 1940. I wasn't born until 1948, but I will say the complexion was there. But were they trying to pass? I'm not. I doubt it simply because, you know, they, they I, I, I wasn't really implying that they were trying to pass. Or yes. That, that, and during those times, there were things you had to do to survive. Yeah. Yes. And to get things done. Yeah. So and I, I, was you, did. I was just wondering, and mm -hmm. so, like, there's nothing wrong with no, that. No, 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 no. I think by the very nature 
of Alonzo Aden's work and Heron's work, the fact that they were highlighting African American artists, the fact that they were associated with Howard University, the fact that as Alonzo Aden came back, he curated shows specifically highlighting African Americans, he was claiming his heritage. Yes, he was very, very fair. Yes, uh, he could have, in social settings, perhaps uh, passed. Um, but I think by his, uh, the nature of his work, uh, by his association with others, um, he was claiming his heritage. Now, I also understand that they were very caught up in the hierarchy, the social hierarchy yes. of Washington, D.C the cave dwellers, the Gold Coast, the, mm -hmm. the idea that there was a black elite, uh, and that was their milieu. Yeah. And that, again, was something that I encountered in throughout many sources that I read. Um, and I don't know, it was also implied that they distanced themselves from darker skinned black people. I think that Dr. Abbott mentioned that in her uh, dissertation, I think that there were other sources that stated that as well. Any other questions? Michael, both you and Bertice mentioned uh, Adolphus's interest in the business aspect of acquiring art and uh, preserving art for the broader community. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Well, I think one of the things that was very striking to me about Adolphus as a person was just how intuitive he was. And I mean, he had an uncanny ability to tune into the individual and as I mentioned I saw him do that in the context of advising people and being able to sort of tailor the kinds of artistic uh, advice, uh, recommendations for investment. Uh, I remember the conversation he had with my friend Richard Dotson where he, he specifically said you need an Alma Thomas. You, you, you know he, he just had this way of tuning in and uh, and it was very inspiring to people. I mean, I saw people just, people were very responsive to his ability to speak to them and to speak to their spirit in a way that was impactful and um, encouraging to them when it came to investments in art and business. And I had forgotten, Martis, about his uh, McDonald's project for children where he, I mean, that was, I, mean, I think he was, again, I, I credit that to his intuition. He, he was able to really follow um, his hunches when it came to um, investment. And again, that McDonald's campaign was a very successful one for children, um, where African American art, you heard the clip, you saw the clip, where he was concerned about children not seeing themselves reflected in art that they were being exposed to and the vacuum that existed for children of color um, when it came to, you know, being able to appreciate art that was a reflection of the cultural dynamics that we face as people of color. So he, he was he was very committed to that. And I think that that was, that, again, I had forgotten that, but that was something that was very successful. And he had other, there were other examples that um, he had that I was able to watch him sort of at work when it came to encouraging people and encouraging people to invest. Whether it was an idea or if it was specific art, he was very creative and he always had that sort of creative flow when it came to investments and uh, encouraging people to invest in art and to pay attention to art. Yeah, for me, I think I'm still trying to unpack all of this because I see myself operating in many of the same ways that the Barnett Eden, uh, the mission and focus of the Barnett Eden Gallery and then certainly the way it kind of found itself as part of um, uh, Ely's practice. And uh, because I'm wearing the cap of the gallery owner, I'm wearing the cap of the art consultant and advisor, and certainly as a curator, I curate exhibitions within and outside of uh, my gallery. And so I think I can better answer that question like next year. <laughs> and I hope to um, develop a, re a very close relationship with the Aiden family and would love for one of the members to come back and be part of this important discussion um, to help me better understand and truly know what was going on and what the intention was. 
And also to uh, equally as important as that is to share the information, the, the truth, because um, it, it, it needs to be known, it, it needs to be understood. Um, you know, we understand, or not we understand, I have studied um, Joseph Duveen, who was the first um, Jewish person, first um, a dealer, art dealer. He established the art market in the U.S. What he realized was that the Rockefellers, the J.P. Morgans, all the industrialists had money here in the U.S., and Europe had all the art. So he would go back and forth. He would bring the Picassos and the Matisse and all of the, those works here to be bought, and that's how they developed their art collections. And he was taking the money and going to Europe and buying it. So I see these three gentlemen as the early Duveens in the context of African American history. And um, so I'm just really, again, just trying to unpack all of that and, and um, how it touches me personally and also certainly how it has, is showing itself in the art market, which I study very closely because as you know, it re I'm required to research and study like the ebbs and flows in the art market and the valuation and pricing of particular artists and, and uh, assigning a dollar amount to that, um, which can be a complicated, convoluted process at times as the African American art, while it is increasing in value, is still, our infrastructure is still very weak. And, um, and, and it very much needs to be strengthened. And part of that strength is now coming from the fact that we have a museum that's dedicated to uplifting, validating uh, our history. And certainly that narrative, that story is being told through the artist's works in that, uh, in that museum. I think we have a person here who has a question first, and I'll go back to you. It's more a uh, comment, and I... And I Please put the mic. Very first. Just up to your mouth. Oh, I'm you sorry. Know. The very first piece of art I ever bought was for Dolphus Ely on Third Street. And the second piece I bought him, by that time he moved to Fort Lincoln. And we had a big, he had a big uh, group of us come over. And, and as you say, he was very good at being able to convince you that this is what you needed to do. <laughs> My then husband walked away and said, you know, do I really want that? <laughs> So he really did have a gift for that. I, I'm not, I didn't know him at all. I didn't know him well or at all or anything like that. It's just that the very first piece I ever bought was from, from that. Which from that artist? Place. Her name is Ellen Goodman. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think there's a question in the back again. I was just thinking and, and observing the conversation that you, all the research that you've done and all the uh, information on here sounds like that there's, I don't know if there's legal stuff going on right now, but as you research and get the history and it sounds like there, uh, you know, some of the history could have been distorted or, and there could be legal ramifications and, and there, there's, you know, controversy in all this. It's not all good and sweet. And that there's things to be uncovered, and I don't know, maybe even retributions. Maybe one of the eight family members. <laughs>
was no places that sort of took the collection in. So now, by, are you talking about upon uh, Harry's death? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. I, I want to comment to that. Yes. Okay. Yes. See, the thing is, Howard didn't do this, and I believe the Smithsonian at that time did not do that. So. So what I read, as it relates to that, and maybe you also may have noted, um, and again, all those sources, and I probably um, tapped into about 30, uh, some that were extensive and others that made brief statements about the collection. But from what I read and gathered, that Herring did not have a good relationship with Howard when he left there. And it was tumultuous, and there was a lot of tension throughout the course of his uh, time there. And so Howard not receiving any of the works from the collection upon his death was deliberate. Because he preceded, as you know, Aiden uh, in, I'm sorry, Aiden preceded Herring in death. So um, that, that's my understanding. That, and that's the reason why uh, Howard did not receive any of the work. I think we have to acknowledge that because... I'm sorry. I think we have to acknowledge that because this was very early within um, uh, the arts industry, particularly African-American art, so much of the story of this collection is about relationships personal relationships, professional relationships. And things get very muddy. And so while we would like to be able to cleanly connect dots, that's not the case here. So I think that it would be difficult and perhaps not a good use of time to try to go back and figure out this, that, or the other. But what is clear here is that there is room for scholarship. There is room for further study. Uh, there are a couple of dissertations that have been written. There are others that I understand other uh, students and scholars that are curious. And we welcome that because there is so much to be discovered. Regrettably, uh, you know, there are not um, first-hand uh, resources, letters and things like that. But what we do know and what was related to us as a family was that there was drama. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's, uh, that's how things get muddy. I love it. Uh, are there any more questions? No more questions? Yes. Yes. Well, the pieces that are in the collection, is that lost? Or, I mean, is some of it lost? Is it all together? Is there a... It's scattered. Is that what you're trying to define? Or the pieces? So, she asked, uh, if all the pieces are together. First of all, it's difficult to document the entirety of the collection. However, we have found that uh, there uh, are paperworks in private hands. Uh, University of Richmond has some, or is it Richmond University? Where? Uh, has some, uh, and it has been, uh, and gifts were made. Uh, Ely made gifts, personal gifts from the collection, so that what was once called the collection, and even what Bob Johnson acquired, was not a collection. It has been scattered. You know who the artists are? I mean, you know, Well, you probably did more work on that as far as who the artists are. I mean, we can reel off the names out. Thomas, Amy Jones. Well, yeah. um, depending on the, the time and era of 
acquisition, sale, and distribution. Um, a lot of the artists who were a part of the original collection are in this exhibition catalog. This exhibition took place at the Anacostia Museum, and it took place shortly after uh, Herring's death, I think in 1970? Well, he died in 69, but the date, okay, the, the exhibition, I'm looking for the exhibition date. I think this is 1970, next 74 is the date of this essay. So it was shortly thereafter. Um, but, you know, as, as was stated, there are a lot of questions surrounding the, uh, where the works landed, what's the core or the original uh, collection that was established under Herring and Aiden, uh, who has full right and ownership over the work, and um, and then the uh, the scholarship. I mean, really, um, the the history surrounding what it was that they achieved, I think, is 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 equally important and should be explored. Do you know if there's oral history? You know, the provenance might be verbal rather than paperwork, and so do we know, have we done extensive oral histories? I'm, I'm yeah. finding that it's the best way to get at um, I spent hours, history. and maybe the Aiden family can, can speak to this, I spent hours trying to find a video. Uh, I found a lot less information about Aiden than I was able to on Herring. And I was not able to find a, uh, a video um, interview uh, featuring either one of them, as I did with, with uh, Ely, if that's what you're speaking of. No, what I'm asking is for the provenance of the works themselves. The oh, where the collection, the artworks. Acquired them may know verbally that this was part of the collection, even though there's no paperwork. Yes. Well, I haven't done that. I have not delved into that level of research in terms of trying to determine where the original works were. Um, we have someone today that said that she acquired a piece directly from Ely. I mean, she may have some clues. Michael, Michael has it. <laughs> Michael doesn't. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> we don't want to put that out. This is going to go on. People are like, let's find Michael Evans. I, I had a couple more questions for you just quickly because we're going to close. And um, because of the relationship that you had with Adolphus, and this is also part of my practice in terms of art education, and um, which is part of the reason that we're gathered here today. And I wondered about your collecting as an individual, um, how that was influenced by Adolphus. I know that he gifted you, but I wondered if... <laughs> Uh, you were also encouraged to build your own collection, how he may have helped to shape and influence and inform your aesthetic as absolutely, well? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And I, I mentioned a little bit about that, but certainly, um, again, I was already in the creative arts side of life in terms of, you know, appreciating music and art. Um, but the association with him helped to sort of sharpen my attention uh, to visual arts and to really begin to be more sensitive and conscious of visual arts in general. When I came to your gallery the first time, the exhibit that you and Alex had hanging was very striking and attractive to me. Um, my sister and I were talking about that and how um, it, I think, had Adolphus helped to just get me, he helped sensitize me to art and to really look carefully and to start to develop a certain appreciation and to find an identity that attracted, attracts me. Um, so yes, it was, it was very influential, but it wasn't something that he said, Michael, do this. It was more of just me having been associated and having been around it and having, again, just having listened and witnessed a lot of the energy and the activity that he was obviously involved in. And there was just such a broad range of that going on. As I mentioned, walking into Alma Thomas's home and seeing her style, and then um, seeing some African uh, masks, for example. I mean, he took me by a, 
uh, one of his colleagues who had lived in Benin and came back with this amazing um, and spectacular collection of African masks that he had hanging in his home. And so, I mean, back then, I had, you know, I really hadn't been exposed to anything like that uh, up close. And so all of that helped to broaden my appreciation for African art, um, other kinds of art. I mean, you know, watercolors were certainly one of my favorite. I love the sort of ethereal feel that watercolor has. That medium really speaks to my spirit in a way that lifts me. Um, so yes, he had, I mean, it was very impactful, but again, indirectly. I mean, just by being, it's sort of like the company we keep, in a way, has an influence. It was an example of how um, being around um, art and uh, hearing people talk about art and being exposed to art makes a difference. And that's what I think he was getting at when he talked about children being exposed to art. I mean, it, whether you know it or not, we're being influenced by art. I mean, pictures make a difference, you know. That kind of raw creativity has an impact on our spirit, I think. And it helps broaden and um, inspire and enliven um, our lives. And I think it just makes us better quality people, more caring people as a result, because it's like we're paying attention. You know, we're paying attention to what's going on around us in a, in a more focused, a more sharpened way than we would be if we didn't have art. And so for me, that was the message that he contributed to my life and the quality that he helped to contribute uh, to me as a person. I think um, it's made me a better person in having that exposure to art. And then the people, artists are always people that I, again, you know, artists are very caring people typically, and I know this is a generalization. We're all human beings and we all have our, our limits, but um, art, People, artistic people, are definitely um, a breed that is very unique and characteristically unique. And it's a lovely thing, you know? I have a dear artist friend who's here. This man right on the front row. Thank you. He's, he's, yeah, he's, he's really a talented artist, too. So, yeah. Well, that was beautifully stated, and I think that we should end on that note. Um, Art has certainly enriched my life in many ways. Oh, we have, no, we have one question. Okay. Yeah, but it's not about anything that's been... No, that's... Okay. The floor is open. Nelson Stevens. Hey, folks. Um, one of the things that's happening is that when I have an exhibit now, a painting is borrowed from a museum. The last painting, I sold a painting to Max Roach. He downsized, gave it to the museum. And when it comes back and it's exhibited, Max Roach is not mentioned. Only the museum. You need another sheet of paper if you want them to preserve your name. That's what I'm saying. And that was an The song. museum won't give you that sheet of paper. Well, see, so you have them deal with gallery merchants. <laughs> <laughs> you understand the point? No, that. Because that's an important part of the provenance of that piece. Yeah. Yeah. It's erased from the whole system. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's good. Mm -hmm. So um, I think I'm mentioning to the right people. So thank you very much. And, and then that's a really important point that you raise, which harkens back to why we, there's some question about ownership and yeah. provenance yeah, with the Barnett Aiden collection and the work that was a, a part of that collection. Mm -hmm. 